The first song we'd like to offer this morning is written by Swami Kriyananda, uh, inspired by the life of St. Francis, entitled, I Wander With Thee. reading is taken from Rays of the One Light, weekly commentaries on the Bible, <clears throat> and the Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda. This is week 40. In surrender lies victory. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. A case might be made for surrender as a path to victory in worldly conflicts, the way of passive resistance, for example, in preference to armed resistance. But our point here concerns a higher kind of surrender, the surrender of our deluded egoic will to the wise and almighty will of God. Human will is, as Paramahansa Yogananda used to say, guided by whims and limited understanding. The divine will is in harmony with every level of reality. Though the divine will sometimes appears to us at first to be wrong, it proves always eventually to be for our highest good. Human will is inconsistent. It leads us one day to success, another to disaster. The divine will, when we surrender to it completely, though it is not always easy to do so, always brings us deep inner peace and joy in the end. Jesus Christ demonstrated this perfect surrender to God's will in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before he was captured and imprisoned, preparatory to his crucifixion. He went apart from the others to pray and asked them to pray also. But when he returned to them, he found them asleep. Out of his love for them, he excused them, saying, The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He then urged them again, saying, Watch and pray. Their weakness in those circumstances was particularly sad, and the disciples of themselves must have regretted it bitterly later on. We all know the symptoms of human weakness, though we may excuse them in ourselves, saying, Well, after all, I'm only human. But what are the signs of true strength? We find in all cases that these are the fruit of a life wholly surrendered to God. The Bhagavad Gita lists these signs in the 13th chapter. Humbleness, truthfulness, and harmlessness. Patience and honor, reverence for the wise. Purity, constancy, control of self. Contempt for sense delights, self-sacrifice. 
perception of the certainty of ill and birth, old age, and frail mortality. Disease, the ego's suffering, and sin. Detachment, lightly holding thoughts of home, children, and wife, those ties which bind most men. An ever tranquil heart, heedless of good or adverse fortune, with the will upraised to worship me alone unceasingly. Loving deep solitude and shunning noise of foolish crowds. Calm focus on the self, perceived within and in infinity. These qualities reveal true wisdom, Prince. All that is otherwise is ignorance. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. Good morning, everyone. My name is Surrender. I'm here with Nayaswami Bharati and Nayaswami's Hanuman and Mari. It's our pleasure to be with you on this beautiful day, and thank you for joining us. I have no doubt that you live your life according to your sense of reason. The choices that each of us makes are the ones that make the most sense to us in the moment. You would not think of crossing the street, for example, without checking to make sure that it's safe and that you wouldn't get run over. Why? Because it's the reasonable thing to do. The more reasonable we are, the better our life becomes. Admittedly though, in less obvious situations, you and I might not always agree on what is the reasonable choice to make. This world is, is made up of many cultures, many generations, people of different uh, social strata. And what this leads to are differences in preference, in priority, in lifestyle, and in all sorts of, of ideas that, that people have. We see this played out every day, uh, for example, between Democrats and Republicans, who uh, obviously have different ideas about certain issues and relish in accusing each other of being what? Unreasonable. Parents and young children might disagree on uh, what is best to eat and when it's time to go to bed. Is, is this natural? Whether it is or it isn't, it is what it is. Regardless of our differences, however, there are certain basics uh, that are universally accepted as practical and, and self-evident that winning is better than losing, for example, or that getting what you want is better than not. But now we come to this puzzling assertion that victory lies in surrender. That's what today's reading is, is trying to sell us. Do you buy it? Good luck on trying to get that across to a college football coach or a corporate CEO. Statesmen like Winston Churchill, athletes like Michael Jordan or activists like Rosa Parks are not celebrated for throwing in the towel. You know, champions in every field are those who are dedicated to winning. Surrender is not a quality that is generally equated with strength. Rather, it implies weakness and passivity. In any competition, victory goes to the strong, 
or at least to the lucky. So it seems rather strange, does it not, that Swami Kriyananda is advocating this, this obvious contradiction, claiming that surrender is the path to higher awareness and, and higher achievement. Anyone new to Ananda might wonder if he missed the memo on uh, survival of the fittest and uh, victory going to the strong. Swamiji is asking us here to consider a number of questions. Is it weak to be humble, to be patient, to be unaffected by how much or how little money you have? And conversely, is it a mark of strength to pursue one's ambitions in a hard driving way uh, and those personal desires? Is that strength? The answers that come from our social conditioning are clearly not in accord with what Krishna was uh, telling Arjuna in the sloka that we read this morning from, from the Bhagavad Gita. So maybe it's, maybe it's time to reconsider what our sense of reason is. Society says that if you want to be happy, you have to climb the ladder of material success. Today's media are filled with pictures and uh, interviews, articles, movies of people who are the icons of fame and fortune. And we're encouraged to get out there and do the best we can to be just like them. When Tushti and I lived in, in India, every year or so Forbes magazine would publish a list of the richest people in India. And in the photos of these folks, you would see expensive clothing, perfect grooming, and a certain pride of, of status and of achievement. Surrender is not a word that would come to mind uh, in seeing these people and at looking at, at what they've accomplished. And if you asked any one of them, are you happy? The answer you would get would probably be, well, of course I am. Why would you even ask such a silly question? I can have whatever I want. At the other end of the spectrum, would be an Indian sadhu walking almost naked in the forest or along the Ganges with a begging bowl for his meals, chanting and, and praying to God. And if you ask him that same question, are you happy? You would get the same answer. Of course I am. Why would you ask such a question? I want for nothing. All that I need, I already have. Well now, who of these extremes even knows what true happiness is? And a fair question to ask ourselves is, uh, which of these two, the sadhu or the corporate tycoon, do we more identify with. On a monetary scale, of course, each of us falls somewhere in between. <clears throat> but in which direction are we moving? Toward greater renunciation or greater acquisition? What is your definition of strength? And does surrender make sense as any part of that? The longer we live, if we're paying attention, the more we come to understand that fame and fortune leave us in the shallows of contentment and often uh, 
more discontented than we would be without them. As the lyrics of one of Swami's songs reminds us, if you're seeking freedom in a marble mansion, you won't find it there. Because even when it's sunny, you'll be counting money, keeping up that showcase, your face lined with care. And if you're seeking freedom on a throne of power, you won't find it there. Because though men all obey you, what if they betray you? Tense you'll be and waiting for foes everywhere. On the other hand, is it, is it spiritually bad to make or to have a lot of money? Money is just energy. And energy has to move. What matters is what you do with it. You might be surprised to learn that Yogananda said, and I quote, money making is the next greatest art after the art of realizing God. All the good and philanthropic works of this world, all noble successes have to be accomplished through money. If you hoard it, you defeat its purpose and your purpose as well. Likewise, if you, if you give mainly to feed your ego with applause and recognition, well, that's not the right spirit either. But when you share your money generously in support of people in need and of high-minded causes, you're serving God and your own spiritual growth. Our affirmation today was on awareness. This gets to the heart of the matter also. If your attention is on the agenda that society promotes, your awareness is obviously outward. You're probably very busy and under some measure of stress, maybe even a lot of stress, trying to maintain a balance between your needs and your desires, and uh, meanwhile doing what you can to manifest comfort and make your life a little bit easier. If that description bears any resemblance to you, are you happy with how things are going? Is it working for your inner life too? And in posing those questions, I don't mean to be impertinent because believe me, I deal with the same questions myself, doing battle every day with my own temptations and not always successfully. What's tricky about all of this is the setup in which we have landed. And frankly, it doesn't seem entirely fair. Here we are blessed with the gift of free will and with it has come the appearance of enormous power, the power to control our destiny. Yet the irony is we have no real power after all, except of a secondary nature because life happens according to its own plan and not according to ours. There's this pesky force called karma that uh, tends to get in the way. The control we want can only come of surrendering our will to the will of that which is actually in control. But it seems we've misunderstood what, what that implies. We hear over and over, never give up, never give up. But what exactly is it that we should never give up? As it turns out, it doesn't mean to fight to the death for uh, your personal desires. It means never give up of letting go of whatever is holding you back from communion with God, from living in bliss. 
It means really paying attention to what is trying to get your attention and to what is trying to happen for your own greater good. Why? Because therein lies the victory that we have been seeking for countless incarnations, the victory of our soul's liberation. The practice of egoic surrender is at the very foundation of a spiritual life. It affirms that we are no longer willing to live a roller coaster existence, a life that alternates between highs and lows, between pleasures and episodes of pain. It affirms our desire to transcend our struggles and transform our negativities, especially our negative emotions. Surrendering our egoic ambitions allows us to return to our true nature, to move with grace and greater ease through this cosmic dance of life. It's a practice of attunement, of attunement to the perfect order of the universe. Yet, even though all of that may sound attractive, the idea of letting go gets downright scary, doesn't it? We want security and serenity. And we're afraid that choosing surrender will be like flying from one trapeze to another without a safety net beneath us. But when we dare to give letting go a try, we discover that security and serenity are part of that package. We find there's a more rewarding plan than the one that we've been chasing for so long. There's a story of Lahiri Mahashaya. It's a story that's been told many different ways. I've, I've heard it many different ways. In fact, Narayan told a version of it last week at our, at our Kriya retreat. But the message is always the same. In a previous life long ago, Lahiri was the great King Janaka, the epitome of the true renunciate leader who ruled solely for the sake of his people, unaffected by the wealth of his own court. King Janaka was called Videha. And in Sanskrit, the word means dead, as in dead to the body, or more accurately, liberated of the body. A young disciple, Sukhdeva, asked him to explain why he was called this. And Janaka said he would tell him that evening, but first he said, there's something I want you to do. And he handed Sukhdeva a bowl of milk that was filled to the brim. And he said, follow me throughout this day, taking care not to spill a single drop. Sukhdeva did as he was instructed. And at the end of the day, King Janaka asked him, what did you see today? Sukhdeva replied that he'd seen only the bowl of milk. So concerned he was not to spill a single drop. You mean you, you did not see the great procession that was held in my honor? The elephants, the chariots, festooned with garlands of flowers, the festive dancing? No, sire, said Sukhdeva. I, I saw only the bowl of milk. My child, said Janaka, and so it is with me. Though I must attend to many things, one thing is in my consciousness above all else. I see nothing that would distract me from my awareness of God. Just as you were focused on not spilling a drop 
of that milk. My mind is ever on the Lord wherever I am. On not losing a drop of my devotion to anything else. May each of us aspire to be as he and to find therein that victory does indeed lie in surrender. I'd like to close with a reading from Whispers from Eternity that speaks to this topic. It's a prayer to man by Paramahansa Yogananda. I was shipwrecked on the storm-tossed ocean of my mere dreams. My vessel of happiness was shattered utterly. Struggling, I tried to swim through those tossing waves of sadness and suffering. Then suddenly a little raft of hope, wafted to me by thy winds of mercy, came floating to me. I grasped it and held on, little by little, Floating thereon, I touched at last upon the golden isle of peaceful silence. Nymphs of thy blessings met me and took me to thy safe presence of eternal reassurance beyond all waves of false hope and crashing disappointments. We think that Surrendering our worldly desires will, will be painful when all that they are really giving up, that we are giving up, are those false hopes and crashing disappointments. Let's take just a moment of reflection. <laughs> Thank you, Saranya. That was, was lovely. That piece um, is by J. Donald Walters, by Swami Kriyananda. It's part of the oratorio that we usually hear around Easter time. We don't often get it as a special presentation like that. It was beautiful. Um, I want you to know what's going on, but Saranya has something else to share with us. Just a moment. So... Ananda and our beautiful Sangha. I love this place. I love these people. And I enjoy sharing, you know, when I can with other people. So I'm wondering if you'd be able and willing to share as well. Would you pull out your cell phones? <laughs> I know, yeah, you don't have one. I know, it's okay. <laughs> if you have one and if you're willing and you have Facebook on your cell phone, um, on Facebook, when you first go to Facebook, you'll see that, and I, I made this because the cell phone is too hard to see from way back there. You see when you first log in, you see this little check-in, this little indicator here, and it says check-in. You can click on that little, little indicator and it will bring up for you, surprisingly, a list that includes Ananda Perland. And you can say, enjoying Sunday service at Ananda Portland Post, and your friends or whoever um, you have connections with will, will know that you're here. 
So it's just a way you can share. It's up to you, um, but it's kind of fun, you know, because all of a sudden there we are, right on Facebook. Um, so uh, thank you. Hope you are enjoying Sunday service. Thank you, Saranya. Um, another way you can share is to get more involved. And this after, right after our service, we have our volunteer fair, which means you can go enjoy the treats and snacks in our um, classroom in the Clarity Room across the foyer there and um, find out more about all the different ways that you can get involved here at the temple um, to support Sunday service and a lot of the other things that go on here. And you can ask questions, of course. We have plenty of people around to let you know um, how to do that and, and answer all your questions. We have coming up this week, Wednesday, the uh, book study on Swami Kriyananda Lightbearer, the book that Asha Praver, Praver wrote. And we have more books here in, um, in stock, so that if you don't have one yet, you can certainly pick one up today. And the book study is for anybody. It's free. Just drop in if you want to share about what you're discovering about that book. And um, then um, Saturday is Harvest Day at the Ananda community, which means this is our fall opportunity to get involved over at the community, to help out, to serve inside, outside, do lots of different projects, have a wonderful lunch together. We're always very well fed. And um, you can come for all um, or part of it. And again, if you have questions, please ask. And then we have a new How to Meditate workshop coming up um, on Saturday as well, from just 10 to 1 here um, with Joy teaching. And um, if you turn over our new little October flyer and look at the back, it tells you about our special weekend coming up, 18, 19, 20. Nalini, Nayaswami Nalini Graber from Ananda Village is going to be here with Maya Tree um, Jones, other, another Maya Tree. And um, they're going to be here for the weekend talking about her new book that's coming out, um, Meeting Life's Transitions with the Ancient Teachings of Yoga. And um, it's going to be a wonderful weekend with a Friday night event, a retreat on Saturday. They're helping with Sunday service. And it's another opportunity for us to um, have time with our guru bhais, our devotees that are not here in Portland, and to learn from someone like Nalini, who has been around for decades with Ananda. She um, was one of the founding members and spent many, many, many years with Swami Kriyananda directly and um, singing the music and teaching and being part of this work. So it'll be wonderful to have her here. Thank you. <laughs>